All right. Well, thank you so much for the introduction, Jairo, and, uh, and for um, uh, Rodney's opening remarks as well. Um, I, I think I'm going to speak to, um, to exactly what uh, Rodney had to say about textbooks. Um, and um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background. Um, and I have my picture here because sometimes we don't have a webcam and um, so excuse the double picture there. But um, I'm the director of CCCOER and I have been for the last eight years. Um, but um, CCCOER, as we call it, I know it's a mouthful, the Community College Consortium for OER um, is part of the Open Ed Consortium. That is the leading um, open education um, organization throughout the world. Um, we have members in 40 countries um, and um, hundreds of universities and colleges participate in this. And I will tell you that the community colleges make up almost a third of the members. So we are a huge part of this open education movement. And, um, so, just today, I know I have a uh, brief period of time and um, Jairo and Rodney will let me know if I go over my time, but I wanna talk to you a little bit about those textbook costs and what the impact has been on students and how, how open educational resources can help with that, um, what that means for both students and faculty, what are those benefits for faculty as well. Sometimes we forget to mention that, but there are benefits for faculty and I think um, some of you who are out there in the audience may um, know about that and can speak to your colleagues later on today as well. And I want to briefly mention what's happening with the open education research. What do we know about how students are doing um, who are taking classes with um, open textbooks and OER as the main instructional material? And then I want to tell you about some events coming up this year uh, that you can participate in uh, both online and um, Actually, today I'm only going to talk about online, but we have a lot of information on our uh, website about how you can participate in conferences around the country, um, if that's a possibility, uh, that are focused on open ed. So um, the CCCOER was actually founded um, over 11 years ago now. We were founded um, by Dr. Martha Cantor. I don't know if some of you out there may know who Dr. Martha Cantor is. She was our chancellor for many years in Northern California. She went on to become the Undersecretary of Education in the Obama administration, and she's currently the Executive Director of College Promise, which College Promise, I think many of you know, is that first year of college free for students um, who are leaving high school in good standing. And um, so tuition free. Um, and I understand from talking to Jairo that you have a very high dual enrollment uh, with high school students. And so um, the textbook costs become a big issue for not only that population, the dual enrollment population, where normally the textbooks are actually purchased by the district when you're in high school or K through 12. Um, and um, also in the case of um, of College Promise students who are being offered tuition free. Um, our mission hasn't really changed in the last 11 years. Um, it's about expanding access to high quality OER, supporting faculty choice and development in their instructional materials, providing them with alternatives to what are out there. Um, but at the heart of it, it's improving student success and helping them to get to their um, academic goals. Um, Hyra mentioned um, some of the work that we do at CCCOER. Um, what has changed in the last 11 years is how open educational resources are distributed, how they're implemented at colleges. And so I've had the uh, good fortune to work with Achieving the Dream on their OER Degree Pathways program, which is 38 colleges and 13 states that are working to provide full OER degree pathways for students. So that means being able to achieve a, a degree or certificate where all of the textbook costs have been 
eliminated through the use of open educational resources. Um, in California, I've had the pleasure of working with um, the community, the California Community College system there. It's quite a large system, 114 colleges serving over 2.1 million students. And they kicked off two years ago what they call a zero textbook cost degree program, um, which is similar to uh, what Achieving the Dream is doing, but it's a statewide program. And so um, making a lot of progress in those areas. Um, and we've worked for a long time with the Hewlett Foundation. Um, you also, Hiro mentioned um, our membership. Um, so we are thrilled to be in 32 states. 11 of those uh, states are statewide memberships. And um, so excited um, that Central Carolina Community College and also Mitchell Community College in North Carolina are members of CCCOER. Um, so I know my time is short, um, you know, and so I'm going to have to get right to it, but I, um, we're going to just jump right in here with um, uh, talking about textbooks. And um, this uh, graphic here, I think some of you may have seen before, but it's, it's a really an eye opener. Um, it's um, a picture of how textbook prices have changed since the 1970s through uh, the mid 2010s. Uh, and so as you can see, um, the prices of textbooks have gone up 1500%. Yes, that's a huge number. Um, since uh, the late 1970s. Um, and when you look at consumer price indexes, um, it has exceeded um, all consumer price indexes with the exception of medical care. <laughs> so there we go. Textbook prices and medical care have uh, both um, gone up dramatically. Um, and I think the really important thing to take away from this, we're not going to go into why those textbook prices have in, increased. Um, that's a discussion for another time. But um, what we know is that that's having a huge impact on our students. Um, so these numbers here are from the Florida Virtual Campus. They, um, every two years, they do um, a large research study with their students throughout their system. Uh, this one was 20,000 students. The majority are um, state college students um, in the, that are participating in the two-year degrees, but it does include some University of Florida students. Um, and they found that um, two-thirds of students choose not to buy textbooks at least some of the time based on cost. Um, for those of us who've been in the classroom um, teaching um, and providing other support, we know that we expect students to have their textbooks. We expect them to have those textbooks so that they can do the readings and the homework. But if we are now aware that two thirds of students are not purchasing textbooks and trying to, um, and trying to go through the class, we can understand why um, there are our failure rates as high as 20%. Uh, students are withdrawing from a class um, at, a, at about 20% rate. Um, these are self-reported numbers um, due to textbook costs. Um, and probably the scariest number is the one at the top there, which is um, they're taking fewer or different classes. So about half of students are doing that. And so we know that's affecting their ability to complete uh, their courses, uh, complete their degrees. Um, and for those colleges, which pretty much every college has had a completion and a graduation initiative, we know that textbook costs are directly in, impacting that ability uh, for us to achieve our goals and, of course, for our students. Um, this, um, this particular um, set of numbers is talking about um, what's happening to students at um, even a more basic level than just purchasing textbooks. So our, our students around the country are, are suffering uh, homelessness and housing insecurity at numbers that are larger than ever before. Um, students report 50% housing insecurity, which means they're, um, they're having trouble paying their rent. Um, and finding a, a place to live. Uh, also, uh, food insecure. Many of our community colleges have food pantries um, on campus to help students with that. So the money that students may be spending on textbooks um, uh, 
could be repurposed as well for basic needs um, such as housing and um, food. And that money can be spent within our communities and within our local economies as opposed to going to a textbook company um, someplace else. So many, many different reasons for uh, looking at that issue. So what, what we know is that if students can't afford these materials, they can't learn um, what we're expecting them to. So what, what, is, what is one of the ways we can approach that? So I wanted to give you a really concrete example here um, of two textbooks. Um, one is the, this is for chemistry. This is for chemistry one. These are for uh, the first two semesters of chemistry. Um, and the one on the left hand side is a Pearson textbook. So this is a fully copyrighted textbook. Um, this is actually the one that's on the bookstore at Central Carolina Community College. It's, a, it's online at your bookstore for students to purchase. Students can rent it for $75.50 for 180 days, um, or they can get a new copy um, for $335. Um, on the right-hand side is um, the open textbook. Um, or it's an open educational resource textbook, if you will. Um, it is from OpenStax, which is a nonprofit organization out of Rice University that does um, about 30 open textbooks for general education, quite a nice variety. It is free online for students and for faculty, of course. So it's free both in a PDF version and or in a web version. Um, you can a student can purchase a softbound version uh, for $55. Um, and it, it's quite a thick textbook. So this is a huge difference. They both cover the same scope and sequence of the first two semesters of chemistry, of basic introductory chemistry. Um, and this can provide uh, an enormous savings for um, students. So um, I invite uh, faculty who are out in our audience today to take a look at the textbooks at openstacks.org and see if they might meet the needs of your classroom and and support your students needs as well any questions about that before i i jump on to the next okay so i want to give you the definition of an open educational resource um, and um, this is um, from the, this particular definition is from the Hewlett Foundation, but also our Department of Education, our uh, National Department of Education also uses this definition. So they're teaching, learning, or research materials in any medium. So they can be online, digital, or they could be a hard copy version um, that have been released under a, um, an open license that permits their reuse. And I'll get into a little bit more detail about what that reuse looks like. Um, so normally the open license that we refer to um, is called a Creative Commons license. And um, that license on a textbook um, means that it can be reused by faculty and students in many ways. Um, it also, Open Educational Resources, also includes materials from the public domain. So this could be materials where copyright has, ex has expired. So you can think of like Shakes works of Shakespeare or perhaps works of the early 20th century uh, in literature um, and other areas, but also many of the science um, works from our um, federal government um, Many of the many of the materials that are produced by our federal government are public domain, and so they are also under that umbrella of open educational resources that can be freely reused um, in the classroom. What are some of the other key items about that OER? It means that students have access on the first day of class. Uh, they don't have to wait till their next paycheck comes in or if they're on student vouchers, um, they don't have to wait for that. They don't have to wait two or three weeks in um, because you can give them access, um, a digital access on that day one. And um, from a faculty perspective, that's also wonderful because you can assume that students have that textbook the first week. So you're not waiting to, um, for students to get their textbooks um, and start their readings two or three weeks in. You can really dive in that very first week because you can assume that students have access. Um, 
many of the materials have um, low cost print options as well. So um, something for, because we know that students um, still um, request print copies um, and um, for various reasons. And so we wanna be able to provide that for them as well. And, uh, and then probably one of the um, most exciting things, and, and not every faculty wants to do this, but faculty can adapt those materials. You can change them, um, you can update them, um, because that's what an open license allows you to do if you choose not to use them as is. Now, I, one thing I didn't mention, but all of those OpenStax textbooks that I mentioned to you are peer reviewed by um, experts in the field. So these are uh, both faculty um, and also subject matter experts that peer review those. So you can be very assured that those textbooks are um, very rigorous. Um, but sometimes um, there's reasons why faculty um, want to change things up. So, um, some of the advantages really from a faculty perspective is that um, you only need to cover the chapters in, in the textbook that um, are important for your class and for the learning outcomes for your course. And so you can remove extra chapters if you want to do that um, so that you don't have to tell students to skip over that. With an expensive textbook, many faculty have told me, I feel like I have to cover every chapter uh, just to make it worthwhile uh, for the money that students have paid. But you don't that isn't a requirement with open ed. Um, there's no requirement for you to change uh, the textbook every few years just because the publisher has decided to um, make some minor updates, um, which um, also eliminates the used textbook market for students. Um, and you can really customize. You can bring in other materials as well um, and remix. And I'll tell you just a little bit more about that. So, um, we could spend an entire hour on, um, eh, probably an entire day on Creative Commons licensing and what the permissions are um, that it provides. But very briefly, um, open educational resources have um, five permissions that we like to speak about. And um, that is, um, it allows a faculty and a student, if, if, if um, this is something that um, a faculty member wants to have students assist with uh, certain, um, uh, options around OER. Um, but basically, as a faculty member, if you are working with OER, you can revise the content um, freely, which is certainly not something that's available um, with, a, with a copyrighted textbook from a publisher. Uh, you can remix, so you can bring in other materials, uh, other OER, other public domain materials into uh, the mix. Uh, you can reuse it over and over again without limitation. Um, that um, Creative Commons license is not revocable for that content. And you can redistribute it, you can share it with your students, of course, but other, also with other colleagues. Um, and finally, you can retain that and keep that copy forever. And that's a really important piece um, because uh, publishers have gone to these rental models um, and, and many of our library, or sorry, our bookstores have um, adopted rental programs to help students with cost. Normally those rental programs have a time limit on them. So an open educational resource is something that you can give your students access to. They can download if there's a PDF version, um, which many of them have. They can download that and keep that on their laptop or other device um, for as long as they uh, want to. There's no limit on that. So any questions on the permissions? All right. <laughs> so you might say, well, how, how, how is this going? How are, how are students and faculty feeling about this? So um, there, is a, there is a group here in the United States that does um, that does a lot of our um, open education research and that's called the Open Ed Group. I think some of you may have heard of them um, and, uh, it, and probably has heard of uh, David Wiley and John Hilton who um, do a lot of the um, wonderful research about this. And John um, has looked at 20 peer reviewed studies on the perceptions of OER quality um, and so that we can present kind of a, um, a more comprehensive solution. There were 16,000 professors and students who were interviewed about their use of OER. And um, the results were um, 
very promising. So 55% of uh, faculty and students said that the OER was about the same as the publisher textbook in terms of quality. And um, as many as 35% said that they felt the OER was actually better. Um, in, um, and about 10%, only 10% said that they felt that the publisher textbook, that expensive textbook, was better than the OER. So these are very promising numbers that perception by both students and faculty is very positive for open educational resources. Um, I also wanted to talk about how are students doing. So um, this is another study that uh, or comprehensive study where uh, multiple, um, once again, this was based on 21 uh, different case studies. Um, 167,000 students' um, grades were looked at uh, for um, their, their classes that used OER. And once again, 95% um, of students did the same or better in a similar course using OER versus one with a publisher textbook. So once again, very promising numbers that students are doing at least as well in their OER courses, sometimes a little better and sometimes a little worse, but at least as well overall in 95% of the cases. And they're saving um, a great deal of money or in some cases, as we know, students haven't been purchasing the textbooks. So now they do have access, uh, which is really helping them with their understanding and learning. So any questions on that one? All right. Um, Jairo had asked me to share um, a couple of case studies of smaller colleges, something like Central Carolina College that has, uh, I think, a, you can correct me here if I'm wrong, but maybe approximately about 5,000 students combined, part-time, full-time. Um, and these colleges um, are from around the country. And they, um, they're small public colleges with traditionally underrepresented students. And I'll tell you what I mean by that as I get there. So West Hills College Lemoore is a small college in uh, California. It's in the Central Valley. It's a Hispanic serving institution. Um, it's part of our, um, our agricultural area. So we have a lot of students um, whose families um, provide farm labor in the area. Um, and open they started with open educational resources, I'm gonna say about two and a half years ago. And they have um, just really um, done an amazing job. Uh, they have participated in a number of those OER pathway programs as well, which has been helpful. Um, but early on, they got support from their administration uh, and from their board. They have an open education resources policy uh, from their board of trustees, which encourages all community college faculty to adopt OER when there's appropriate OER uh, appro OER of appropriate quality and rigor with acceptable supplemental uh, resources available. Um, so right from the top, there's been a lot of support. Um, there's also been professional development provided. Um, their library runs their open ed program, which is an interesting um, model. Um, and um, in 2017-18 alone, uh, they saved $400,000 for their students. And so, and keep in mind, this is a small student body. Um, and by 2020, they, their target is that all of their general ed courses will be converted over to use OER. And they're well on their way. They're over halfway there. Um, and they, as of this fall, they've been offering two what they call Z degrees. So these are... Um, a full degree pathways uh, where all of the textbooks uh, have been replaced with OER um, or zero cost materials in both psychology and teacher education, which is two of the programs that are quite large on their campus. So uh, a, a, um, really a very impressive um, uh, showing by uh, West Hills College Lemoore in California. Um, the next one I wanted to mention was Bay College in Michigan. They're in the Upper Peninsula, and they have been working on um, OER for um, just about three years now. Um, 
and they have saved their students over 600,000 on textbooks um, since, uh, since they started in 2015. They're a little bit smaller than West Hills College, I, I think uh, somewhat under 5,000. Um, they have 35 courses that currently use OER. Um, I'll provide these um, slides to you later. There's, there's a link on this page, which will take you to their, uh, to their site, their OER webpage, which lists all of the courses that they've converted to OER and links to the textbooks. So if you have faculty who are interested in seeing what uh, Bay College, um, the textbooks that they have both created and adopted, uh, you can get um, a glimpse right there. Um, they also were part of achieving the degree, uh, sorry, achieving the dreams OER degree initiative, and they've been offering an OER degree pathway in liberal arts since the fall of 2017. Now, I, I mentioned traditionally under underrepresented students. Um, they have a they have over half of their students are either first generation or lower socioeconomic. Um, or students with disabilities. So that's how we come up with the traditionally underrepresented students at Bay College. So another wonderful um, model for small colleges that have been very effective. And their program is run out of um, their distance learning um, department, um, which uh, works very closely with the library as well, but with instructional design and, and all of that. All right, any questions about those? I, I think it's great to hear about the small colleges that are doing well. We do have a, a, quite a few wonderful case studies um, about larger colleges and full college systems. Um, but in many cases, there's lots of resources there um, which can make that easier. But these small colleges are really um, doing a, a super job. And we have over 15 case studies on our website of um, colleges that, colleges and system-wide um, case studies as well, that have completed uh, full OER degrees or, or Z to Z, ZTZ degree pathways. And so I invite you to check those out when you have time. So I know I'm running a little short on time now. I think I'm supposed to finish up in the next five minutes and I wanted to get to some Q&A. I wanted to mention there's some great online events that you can actually bring locally to your campus, to Central Carolina. And I know there's folks from other colleges there as well. Today, the Open Education Week uh, is a global celebration uh, throughout the world of open ed and it's the first week of March. Um, I invite you to submit um, a, uh, propo a, a, a proposal, um, all, all proposals are accepted, um, but you can highlight some of the work that you're doing in open ed by submitting that here. Uh, CCCOER will be doing um, a number of webinars that week um, and we will be inviting folks from our community and um, perhaps Hiro can provide me with names of faculty at Central Carolina that might wanna participate in um, the webinars that week. Um, but there's also, these webinars are broadcast around the world. So you can um, go up there and find the schedule. And we'll also be publishing that on our website um, and find what might be interesting for you to hear about open education, not only in the US, but uh, around the world. Um, CCCOER provides monthly webinars. Um, and I hope some of you have been attending those. Um, here's our topics for um, the spring. Um, and we'll be publishing this schedule probably next week. People are still on vacation. We had the dates, but I didn't want to put the dates on here till I got approval from the rest of my executive council. Um, but we're going to be talking about OER adoption. What does that look like from a faculty and institutional perspective? We're going to be talking about dual enrollment and open educational resources. That's probably in April. And I know that Hiro mentioned that uh, dual enrollment is a big part of um, the work that you do at Central Carolina Community College. Um, so I'll be picking Hiro's brain for that one in April. Um, and we're going to talk about OER and ZTZ degree pathways. We've spent a lot of time on that over the last two years, but uh, we'll be bringing people up to date on that one. And then we'll be talking about regional models for OER implementation um, in our June webinar. So I want to invite all of you out there who are interested in um, joining this conversation uh, to participate in our community. Um, if you go to our website, um, and I've got the link up here, um, 
under Get Involved Community Email. You can join our community email list. We share all of our events through that email list. So uh, you're welcome to participate in all these monthly webinars that we provide. Um, we have opportunities for collaboration and showcase that we share. Um, we have some special ones that we share with our members, but we share with the wider community most of this information. And we have a lot of resources on our website that you can uh, share with other faculty, librarians about licensing, about how to find OER. So please use those resources. They're available to everyone. Here's just a small group of some of the folks who present with us on a regular basis. I think some of you, you'll recognize some of these, uh, these folks um, and they're amazing. And we'd like to put um, some of Central Carolina uh, Community College folks in, this, in, our, uh, in our gallery here. <laughs> all right, um, that is all I had to present and I'd like to uh, open this up for a few questions if we have a few minutes, but that's up to Jairo and, and Rodney. Thank you, Anna. So, yeah. Thank you. Anybody have any questions at all? Oh, You may have come over to this and I missed it, but when you did the feedback and they said that like 10% of the people said it's worse, do you have any anecdotal information on that? I mean, what, what did they complain about? I think, I think I heard your question. You said on the 10% who uh, reported that um, the OER was worse. Um, I don't have the details on that um, right now, um, but I'd be happy to share that. That research is published, um, so I'd be happy to, um, to pull out that research and, and send it to Hiro. Um, the, the things that they look at in terms of evaluating um, is sometimes the formatting of um, materials. It can also be the images that are available. Uh, th that kind of thing. So, um, but I, I don't have the specifics, but I'd be happy to dig that out for you. I, I, I would give you um, lots of chapters to go to the back of the history book. Back to the very superficial about it. It's not a completely problem. It's not a 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 problem. So one of my concerns is with um, students that don't have access to computers or internet. And if you have, say, for example, I have a student who has an internet and who works full time and the only resources are digital. You know, in that case, I don't know if they will access for those conditions. Um, I'm, I'm going to have to ask you to repeat that. I, I can't. Oh, I, I said, Una, she said one of her um, concerns was access. She said for those students that may not have a computer or internet access at home and only access, if we're only providing digital, um, what, what can they do? Well, uh, so what, what um, if the student doesn't have access from home, I think it's really important to make sure that there's low cost print options available. Um, so, I mentioned to you that OpenStax will provide um, somewhat low cost, it, uh, and they will work with your. You can work with your bookstore through the National Association of Bookstores um, to order those textbooks. They're still approximately for the for the heavy science textbooks. They're still about fifty dollars. Um, so a number of colleges have also taken those materials, um, taken the PDF, and they've actually done prints through their uh, repro department. And in that case, they can often sell the textbook at just slightly above the cost of the paper and ink, which you know comes out about fifteen dollars. 
um, which can be far more affordable for students because I, I absolutely hear you that some students won't have access at home. And so in that case, it, it really does become critical to have a, a very low cost print option available. So thank you for that question. Sorry, I can't lose that in my eyes. Yeah. <laughs> my question would be, um, what about the ancillary materials that we often get from the textbook publisher that we use as faculty members, whether that's PowerPoint starters, test banks, that kind of thing that we use in face on? Did you hear that question? I did. Okay. Yes, and, and that that is an issue um, that needs to be addressed. And I will say that, um, so I mentioned to you the OpenStax textbooks, they have about 30 textbooks that cover a kind of the general ed courses. They actually provide ancillaries um, to instructors. So with OpenStax, and I, you may be going through this later on today, um, faculty um, who want access to those PowerPoints um, and, and, and sometimes test banks as well need to register. But what we found most effective is um, in cases, and there will be some cases where there isn't um, an existing ancillary that is needed, um, is having um, faculty work together to produce those. Um, but more and more, there are ancillaries available. OpenStax has been kind of the leader in this. They provide a, um, a hub where faculty can share. This is faculty from around the country. Anyone who wants to, who wants to or is using OpenStax is sharing ancillaries, um, discipline-specific ancillaries on the OER hub as well as the ancillaries that OpenStax provides. So there is more and more of that coming, but I will say that in some disciplines, it still is a growing area. So another, another excellent question. Okay. Thank you, Una. we really appreciate you uh, taking these questions. We appreciate you uh, taking the time out to speak to us today. Um, we're gonna transition over now to get our student um, testimonials. And so you're more than welcome to stay on if you would like to. Um, but it's totally up to you. I'll listen in for a little bit, okay? I'll okay. just turn off my mic. So thank you once again for inviting me um, and have a wonderful day. I'm excited, I'm so excited that you're doing this the first week of January. It's, it's a wonderful way to kick off the new year. Okay.